Good evening and welcome to Let's Study the Word. I know that you have many options and the fact that you chose to spend the next hour with me in studying the word so that we can show ourselves approved, workmen rightly dividing the word of truth, I am so grateful. We're in for a journey. We're going into the word of God and we are indeed going to get a word. So I'm going to ask that you turn in your Bibles to the book of St. John chapter 11. And before we get into the word, I'm just going to ask us to pray. So let's bow our heads and ask for divine intervention this evening. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your mercy and your grace. We give you thanks for your loving kindness. We give you thanks, mighty God, that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. We give you thanks that you are indeed here for us and that you have a word for us in this season. Lord, in everything, we put you first, calling you Abba calling you daddy. Lord, we put every plan of the enemy under subjection tonight. And we decree and declare that your word will come true clearly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. I'm going to be reading from the NIV version. So turn it to me in your Bibles to the book of St. John chapter 11. We're going to jump over to the King James Version because I want you to hear one particular verse from the King James Version, and then we'll continue reading afterwards. So we're starting at St. John chapter 11. We're going to be reading verses one to six. I'm going to read verse six from the King James Version, and then we'll jump back over. Is that all right? All right, let's go. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who had anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. I want you to underline that. Rather, it's for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. We're going to stop there. I want to read it from the King James Version now, that verse six. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he being Lazarus, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Jump over now. Are you ready? Move over. Let's start at verse 11. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was re referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Underline that. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Right? Verse 17. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on that last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, 
even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe in this? She said, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one coming into the world. And when she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. We're going to stop right there. This is the word of the Lord. If I had to put a title to today's message, it would be called Great Expectations. I want you to write that topic down. Great Expectations. There was a book written by Charles Dickens with that same name, Great Expectation, and it tells the story of a young man who went through quite a bit of things in life to achieve what he would come to. It's a story about friendships and about loss and about games. And some call it the great classical novels and others call it one of the most boring books they've ever read. But I'm not going to talk about the theme or the storyline that Charles Dickens wrote. Instead, I'm going to steal from him the title of his novel because I believe that that title is most apt to this story great expectation. The story is set in the New Testament and it's just a two or three chapters before Jesus enters into Jerusalem with the palms being waved and Hosanna being sung on the sound of the wind. It, it, it's those chapters that leads up to what would now become for us the great architect who started in Genesis, unfolding time and history, coming to what is the climax of moving man from a state of sin where they had fallen in Genesis chapter three to a place where we could now be reconciled unto God the Father. And as he enters this last phase of his life, these last few weeks of this journey of 33 years that he has spent on earth, he makes his way to Jerusalem. And as he makes his way, he gets a call. The Bible tells us that he had three friends who he was very close to, three friends who were not the typical friends because they were not a part of his inner circle of disciples. They were not a part of the 12. But these friends were very dear to Jesus. In fact, the brother is said to be one whom Jesus loved. The brother is so special to Jesus that when Jesus gets a certain news, his reaction is out of the ordinary. But we're jumping the gun, so let, let's go back a little bit. So these three friends are actually siblings, and they live in this village called Bethany. And Bethany is about two miles away from where Jesus would breathe his last. Bethany is two miles from Jerusalem. And as they are in Bethany, going about their daily business, the brother by the name of Lazarus gets ill. And it seems to be a serious illness to the point where the sisters felt it was important to get a message to Jesus. Verse five tells us now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he stayed two more days. There seems to be a conundrum in this relationship that God has with these siblings. On one hand, we know that he loves them. He is very clear in this the sisters know that they are loved and that Lazarus is loved because when they sent the message, they said, Jesus, the one you love has 
fallen ill. And I know for a personal fact that if I love someone and I hear that they're ill, my first immediate reaction is to figure out how am I going to assist? Whether it is that they're in the house and I'm going to run around and try to find some medication, or if it is that they don't live in the house, I have to get cash to them so they can buy the medication if that's the need. Or if they have the cash and they have bought the medication, then I'm going in prayer to back up man's medicine with the Holy Spirit, anointing and connection. So I am of the opinion that when you say you love, you back up this word love with your actions. So it seems to me that it's a conundrum that one hand we're hearing that he loves them. And then when he hears that Lazarus is sick, he stays where he was for two more days. It's a conundrum because if you love me, I have an expectation of you. The Bible tells us that when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he then said, this will not lead to death. Remember, I asked you to underline that statement. That statement was in verse four. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory. And it would seem a conundrum because later on, few verses later in verse 11, he then looks at the same disciples who he makes the statement to and says to them, Lazarus has fallen asleep and I'm going there to wake him. And when they didn't understand, he then was very blunt with it. He says, Lazarus has died. It's a conundrum because you just told me that this is not illness unto death. And now you're telling me, Jesus, that he's dead. I don't know. If you have a conundrum happening in your life, in your situation, in your circumstances, where you have an expectation, it may be a great expectation, but the play out does not seem to fall in line with what you are expecting. We say that these siblings are not ordinary, that God has a special relationship with them. How do I know that God has a, a, has a relationship with them? That when he finally turns up at the tomb in verse 17, he hears that Lazarus has been buried and in the tomb for four days. And the Bible tells me that when he reaches the tomb and he has a conversation with Martha, who has come running out to him, she cries and she says to him, if only you had been here. She had an expectation that his presence would have brought a resolution to her brother's situation. She says something very interesting in verse 22. If you have your Bibles, whether on your phone or a hard copy, I want you to look at verse 22. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. What was Martha's expectation? On one hand, the statement would seem as if she's saying, God, you can do whatever you, you, you want to do. God, you can make a difference even at this situation. It's almost like she's saying, God, I believe that you can change this from death to life. But she doesn't quite come out and say it. And Jesus looks to her and says, 
your brother will rise again. But instead of building on her great expectation, she doubles down. She, she, she sort of steps back. She, she, she doesn't stand on the assurance of what she seems to believe. She takes a back pedal and she says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection. How much more would her expectation have been fulfilled, I imagine, if she said, yes, Lord, I know he will rise again and I know you can do it right here, right now. But no, she, she doubles down on her expectation and what could have been a great expectation becomes a ordinary expectation. I know he will rise again in the great by and by, in the resurrection to come on that last day. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they were dead, yet shall they live. And this is a confirmation to her current expectation. And Jesus says to her, do you? believe this. And she says, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah. Now, you've got to understand that when a Jew confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, she is saying he is the one who is to come, the promised one, the one who was promised to Eve in the garden of Eden. The Jew, when they confess this, believes that this is the one who is going to come and save them from all the issues and problems they're faced with, or from, from the Roman government and their tyranny. This, this belief system of the Jews is that Jesus was going to come, and when he comes, this Messiah was going to make them the kingdom that all the world would look to. But in this, it's still an ordinary expectation for her. Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. And she leaves it at that. She went back and she says to Mary, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. These two sisters, however, had different expectations. While we started the story in John chapter 11, I want you to understand that the story is one that has further insight into the character and the belief system of the believer. Mary goes running to Jesus when she is now called. And when she goes running to Jesus, she is crying and she is weeping and she's pouring out everything because Mary is angry. <laughs> Mary is not as calm as Martha about this situation. Mary is mad at Jesus because she had an expectation of Jesus. And in her mind, Jesus had not lived up to what her expectation was. I want you to turn with me in the same book of chapter 11 of John. And I want you to move down to when Mary goes to Jesus in verse 32. The Bible says, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This is almost word for word for what Martha had said earlier as we had read. But when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in his spirit and deeply 
moved. I want to challenge us this evening that when your expectation is great, when you have a connection with God and you have an, a hope of glory, when you have a faith that moves mountains, when you are expediting that faith into the atmosphere, you change some things. I want to tell you that you have the opportunity based on your expectation to disturb the spirit realm and to move God. Are you ready to move God this evening? Are you ready to change some things in the atmosphere and create a shift as to where you are? Let's continue reading. Jesus says, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And the scripture tells us, Jesus wept. This is the only time where we see Jesus is confronted with a sickness, a disease, a death, any type of situation that is common to man. And he confronts it and he cries. There was a woman who lost her son and she's walking to the funeral behind the funeral prior and Jesus sees her on this road called Maine and when he sees her he has compassion on her and he raises her son time and time again through scripture we see where Jesus is confronted with those who are sick and those who are filled with disease and the bible tells us he is moved and he's compassioned he has a heart of compassion for them and he does something about it but never ever ever do we see Jesus weeping but when he comes to Lazarus's tomb the bible tells us Jesus wept. His friend is dead. Was that why he cried? Mary and the Jews from Jerusalem were crying. Was that why he cried? He knows that in a few weeks, he too would be in a tomb. Just like his friend Lazarus. Was that why he cried? Or could it be he is crying because his people didn't get it? The disciples certainly didn't get it because on one hand, he told them that this would not lead to death. And then he told them that Lazarus was dead and they didn't ask. But God, I don't get it. They did not show any level of great expectation. God, you said that he, this would not lead to death. So God, what, what does this mean? Martha had come to him and she started, oh, well, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And he had said to her, your brother will rise again. And she said, I know. Whatever your father asks, whatever you ask of your father can be done. Yes, he's getting the, that, that jerk. Yeah. So do you believe I can I'm the resurrection and the life? Yes, Lord. And I know he'll rise again on the last days. And it drops. And here comes Mary. And she too is angry at him. He knows what's happening in our hearts. He knows what's happening in our thoughts. He knows what's going through our minds. And she is mad. You say you are our friend. You say Lazarus is one you love. And we're standing at his tomb. Why? Why? Lord, you say you love me. Lord, Lord, you say that you're doing, you're, you're standing for me, that you're a mediator between heaven and earth. You're standing in the gap for me. And I have to be on this job that I don't like. Why? Lord, you, you tell me that you love me and all the people that I love around me have died. Why? Lord, you 
tell me that you love me and my body is wrapped with pain and sickness and the doctor's report is not what I want to believe. God, why? I have this great expectation of you because you're the God who made the heavens and the earth. You're the God who made the stars and the universe. You're the God who blew breath in man. God, I have this great expectation, but I have this conundrum because my expectations are not being met at the level that I thought they would be. And Jesus was. Some of the Jews said, see how he loved him because they saw him crying. Some criticized and said, if he had loved him so much and he could open the blind eyes, couldn't he have kept this, his friend from dying? And verse 38 tells me then Jesus Again, I want you to underline that word, again, greatly disturbed. Why is he disturbed? Because the people have no expectation. They saw death and called it death. And so the expectation is in a tomb. Locked behind a stone. Have your dreams been locked behind a stone? Have your hopes become lost? Are, are you just going through the ropes? Are you just making it day by day? But everything is locked behind a stone. Do you even have any expectation of that? Or are you just going through the motions of what church says you ought to feel. We're talking about great expectations. When we talk about great expectations, for Mary and Martha. I want you to turn in an earlier chapter of the book of Luke. I want you to turn in St. Luke chapter 10. As a matter of fact, let me use the King James Version for this. I want you to turn in your Bibles to St. Luke chapter 10. And we'll be looking at verses 38 to 42. We've not finished We're continuing. St. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. Now it happened as they went, he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not hear that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. You are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which I will not take away from her. We're still looking at the characters of Mary and Martha, but we are going to roll back the curtains of time before this scene at the cross at the grave. And I want you to understand that these two women, these two characters who now stands before Jesus, both of them with an attitude, with a question, with a, with a, with a concern, why weren't you here? 
And if you had been here, I know something would have been different. I want you to understand their backdrop. This is the same Mary and Martha whose story is told in the book of St. Luke chapter 10. And this is almost the induction to this friendship. And Jesus comes into their home. And when he comes into their home, Martha is the busybody, making sure everything is going all right. She made sure that the crowd, the 12, those who followed Jesus, that they would get a good meal, that they were comfortable, that their hands and their feet would be washed according to the prescribed customs of Judaism. Yes, this is the same Martha who welcomes Jesus and that's what he says to her is a feat because in those days, it's a patriarchal society. It's a men's society. And as much as Lazarus seems to be the male of the household, it seems that he's the he is younger than Martha because in this story, we don't even hear him mentioned. But what we see happening is Martha is the one who is doing the welcoming. She's the one getting everything in order. So it seems that a part against tradition, Martha was in charge. Martha was the one getting all these things done. And Martha's expectation was work. Let me put things in order. Let everything be in alignment. And that's how many of us approach our journey in Christianity. That's how many of us approach Jesus with our expectation. If I do this, then God is going to do that. So I'm going to live a good Christian life. I am going to expect that Jesus is going to bless me. So Jesus, if I'm going to church, my expectation is built on the fact that I shouldn't get sick. Come on now, drop a hallelujah in the chat because we know that's what we think. Lord, I must be blessed because I am in alignment with your will because I'm constantly working. I'm on the praise and worship team. I'm on the choir. I'm on the prayer prayer team. I, I, I preach for you. I teach for you. I handle tracks for you. I welcome people into the sanctuary. I'm on the ushers team. Our expectation is like Martha. Let me work for my blessing. But here in the story, Jesus calls Martha by her name twice. Martha, Martha. And when Jesus calls you by name twice, he's trying to get your attention. And what he said to her is something that is key. He says, Mary has chosen a better path. What was Mary's path? Mary did what was also out of tradition. So both of these women were out of tradition. They were out of alignment. But where Martha seemed to be out of alignment with customs dealing with who is the head of the household and who is responsible for work and who is responsible for feeding and welcoming the crowd, Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now you've got to understand in those days when you sat at the feet of the teacher, you were a student. So the disciples were the students who were expected to be sitting at the feet of the master. Just like how Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. You sat at the feet to study and to learn, to show yourself approved. Right now you're sitting at the feet of God and you're going into his word and you are asking for more than the ordinary. You're asking for the more than enough. You got an expectation, but your expectation is not in alignment with work. Your expectation is in alignment with faith like Mary. Because the better way is that your faith aligns with God. Your hope, your dreams, your vision must be in alignment with God. And when you're in alignment with God, then your expectations must be greater than the natural. 
their expectations must be even greater than God will take me out of all of this on the resurrection day. Your expectation has to be bigger than what your mind can even conceive. But that expectation only moves to that level. You only go to that path when you are sitting in relationship, when you are feasting at the table, not of food, but the table of word. So Mary has a backdrop. Mary has an expectation because she has sat at the feet of Jesus and she felt that God was out of alignment. And her emotions were so forceful. Her expectation was so great that it moved the spirit of God. Have you ever seen this in scripture where somebody can move the hand of God? Do you remember Hannah? Do you remember when Hannah went into the temple? during the feast when everybody else was going to give their sacrifice and everybody was else was there having a a, a, a a party because the feast was like a party hannah at the time that was not ordinary it wasn't the evening um sacrifices or the early morning sacrifices oh no she was in the temple at a time outside of the ordinary so that when the priest saw her when Eli saw her, he thought she was drunk this early in the morning, but she was pouring out her heart before God. And as she poured, her expectation raised so great inside her, it moved the hand of God. This evening, I want to challenge us that our expectations can move the hand of God. It can change the atmosphere. It can change the spiritual makeup around us. Just having that great expectation. Go back to chapter 11 of John. Mark that spot in Luke. But go back to chapter 11 of John. Jesus' spirit is disturbed. He is disturbed in his spirit and he is moved by the tears of Mary. He then becomes disturbed in his spirit when the people started in their minds and in their thoughts and in their whisperings complained how, how come he never heal Lazarus? He's disturbed because his own disciples have no greater expectation than that on the resurrection day, like Martha, Lazarus will be raised. Even though he has said to them, this is for the glory of God. Even though he has said to them, this will not lead to death. No expectation, no faith, no hope. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The scripture tells us, you know, it's awesome that you believe because you are seen. But how great it is for those who have not seen but believe. It disturbed Jesus. It disturbs the spirit of God when the people of God have no hope and no expectation. So he says, take away the blockage. Verse 40. He says to Mary, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? 
So they took away the stone and prays to his father. Then in verse 43, he cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his feet and his hands bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This evening, God is saying that we need to unbind some expectations that we have restricted in our lives. Some of us have some dreams, some of us have some vision, some of us have some hopes, and we have bound them. We have tied them. We have wrapped them in the criticisms. We have wrapped them in what other people say. We have wrapped them in what other people believe. We have wrapped them, we have bound them, and we have hid them behind the stone walls of the grave. If you were to let it go, those visions and dreams would come bursting out. If only we would have great expectations. As I wrap up, I want us to turn to the book of John, chapter 12. Turn to the book of John, chapter 12, one chapter later. Six days before the Passover, Jesus comes to Bethany to the home of Lazarus, whom he has raised from the dead. So expectation is now alive and sitting in its house. There they gave a dinner for him, <laughs> and Martha continues to serve. And Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. And Mary, who once sat at the feet of Jesus, who learned how to have a relationship, who learned how to have a great expectation, who saw expectation come alive at her brother's grave, does something that boggles my mind. She takes a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard and she anoints Jesus' feet and she wipes them with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. If you have great expectations and if you release them into the world, and if you give an offering of them to God, I promise you this, God will fulfill each and every single one of those expectations. And he will say to the naysayers, as he said in verse seven, leave her alone. She brought it so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. God is willing to break through for you. God is willing to show up for you. God is willing to stand in defense of you. You only put your great expectation and your offering before him and trust him to do abundantly more than you can ask or imagine. Thank you for joining me on Let's Study the Word. We upload to YouTube on a Thursday night. We try to upload to Facebook on a Sunday. We have been having significant difficulties getting onto Facebook. But if you know somebody who usually uses Facebook, just redirect them to Let's Study the Word on YouTube. Until next week, I pray that your expectation will overflow and that it will break out.
that any dream that you had that once had been so prevalent in your thoughts and in your hearts and in your desires that you have bound it and locked it away behind closed doors and behind stones due to the criticisms and the naysayers in your lives. I pray that it will break forth and you will anoint it with an offering that will draw the attention of God and disturb the spirit realm and create a change. Until next week, when you join us one more time, I pray that God's blessing will be upon you and that his word will come alive in your hearts. Love you. See you next time.